my wife and I, Sarah, is here today. We uh, just returned from about a week um, of, a, of a, a vacation up along the eastern um, seaboard. We got 11 states. I think we ate our way through them, pretty much, which <laughs> for me, it's all about, I love fish, anything fish, all of it. Um, it, was, it was a fantastic time, and we did it not so much in the hope of what we would leave behind or that we were wearied of what, what, what was, but as much more of what we hoped to recover uh, in, in ourselves. There's that inner peace that, you've, that maybe you've lost, and you go on a vacation really to get yourself back, to, to enjoy again what is deepest and what's truly true. And today, in, the, in, our, in our message that will be brought by Pastor Andrew Farley, um, he is going to assist us with this very same thing, is recovering the truth that affects us, that does something to us, and that ushers us into our day, um, not just to do things, but to know things and to see from what God did and is doing for us. There's a verse I'd like to read. Um, it's this one, Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. Since then, you have been raised with Christ. Just think about that for a second. Have you thought about it yet today? Well, you have now. If you're in Christ, you've been raised already. So since then, you've been raised with Christ. How did that happen? Where am I now? All those things that come from that. Set your hearts on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things, for you died, and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. Isn't that a good thing? When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And that is what our sermon series, the beginning today, the art of doing, and today it's nothing. And how God loves to prove to you who he is and how he is with you by you doing nothing and him doing everything. Let's pray and, and offer our minds to the Lord. Father, thank you for this way of transforming our thinking, of renewing our thinking so that we would be transformed even to ourselves to remember who we are and how we are with you and then with each other that the church is alive and well because you've seen to it. This is us because you've seen to that. In Christ's name, amen. The art of doing nothing. Now, when I present a sermon title like that, I get nervous. You want to know why I get nervous? Because people out there on the wild world web are going to misunderstand uh, they're going to freak out. They're going to think that we're teaching passivity. They're going to think that we're teaching there's nothing to do, no decisions to make in the Christian life. And let me just say at the outset, that is not the message for this morning. But I will say that there is a beautiful reality to discovering that we don't have to do certain things in the Christian life. And when you jettison, when you get rid of certain things in the Christian life, you just start to ease into Jesus. It's no longer the Christian life. It is the Christ life. It is no longer a thing or a movement or a self-improvement program. It becomes a genuine connection and relationship with Jesus Christ. And so this morning, we're going to talk about the art of doing nothing. And I've picked four things that Christians don't need to do. Now, uh, again, we'll talk about what this means for us personally, but first, a little bit of Italian would be good, I believe. Uh, dolce far niente. What does that mean? Well, it's an Italian expression, the sweetness of doing nothing. Another way to put it is pleasant relaxation in carefree idleness. Now, doesn't that sound good? I mean, what if you could do that without a flight to Hawaii? What if you could do that without trying to get away? You could do it right where you're at in the midst of your life to have this sort of sweet nothingness. Sweet nothingness? Well, it's only going to come when Jesus relieves us from the something so that we can enjoy the nothing. 
And this morning, we're going to talk about that. But again, I want to emphasize at the beginning that especially for those who are new to the message of grace, we're not talking about passivity. Man, there are plenty of uh, decisions to make, important decisions to make. When temptation comes knocking, when there's a chance to love somebody, when there's a chance to express Jesus, there's all kinds of choices that we make moment by moment. So we're not talking about passivity, but we are talking about ditching that religious guilt. We are talking about ditching all of that effort that maybe we've exerted over the years to try to get God to like us and to try to get on his good side. Can anybody relate to that? Have you ever felt like you've been trying to get on God's good side and you just keep falling over to the bad side and then you're trying to crawl back to the good side? You get over there and then you backslide, they say, right? You're backslidden. Well, that's the sort of stuff we're going to talk about this morning. Now, secondly, I want to say that we're talking to believers here. I mean, this message is for those who have already made the decision to put their confidence in Jesus to put their confidence in what he did, to put their confidence in the finished work of Christ. So if you're not a believer yet and you're here this morning and you're exploring the gospel message, fantastic. But today you're going to hear about the benefits of already being in Jesus Christ. And it is awesome. There's nothing else on the planet like it. So let's dig in. First, let me say there are plenty of things to do. In other words, you could survey the New Testament and find dozens of behavior passages. You could find all kinds of attitude and action type passages. There are plenty of decisions to make. Obviously, we offer our bodies to God. We walk by the Spirit. We set our minds on the truth. We love other people as Jesus has loved us. I mean, that is a no-brainer. But here are four things that many Christians think they have to do in order to stay on God's good side. These are things that we don't have to do. Get more forgiven. Get closer to God. Fix your heart and feel something. And I am so excited to talk about these this morning because I think that these four things consume a lot of Christian energy. These four things consume a lot of our thought processes, a lot of the ways that we uh, try to relate to God and live out the Christian life. And man, if you could just knock off these four things from your mental library, what you're exerting energy to do, then you just might be freed up a little more to do what? Well, maybe some of these things. <laughs> Offer your body, walk by the Spirit, set your mind, and love other people. But I cannot love other people. I can't even think about other people if I am consumed trying to do all of this. Get more forgiven. Get closer to God. Fix my heart and try to feel something that I'm not currently feeling. So a good example of the art of doing nothing would be Abraham. I mean, think about Abraham. He was given a promise, right? And we all know that Abraham kind of bailed on that promise. I mean, if you recall the history of, of that event, Abraham was told that he would have a son, and that son would be Isaac, and that Abraham was going to be the father of many nations, and it was a beautiful promise from the mouth of God himself. And what did Abraham do? Abraham did not do nothing. He did something. He went and concocted a plan B with another lady in order to have another child as a plan B just in case. So Abraham didn't practice the art of doing nothing, did he? So that's a good example of what I'm talking about. Abraham could have chosen to rest and practice the art of doing nothing, knowing that God was going to make good on that promise. Now, here's the difference, guys. We're not waiting for God to, to make good on His promise. He already has. We're not waiting for God to fulfill some prophecy. He already has. We're not waiting for Jesus to make us right. He already has. So it's even better than what Abraham was called to do. 
Abraham was called to put faith in a future thing. We are called to put faith in something that's already finished. Even better, right? And so I present you with my grandfather's license plate. This was my grandfather's license plate in the year 1979 in Virginia. I am okay, are you? Now, I don't know why he chose that, but it just fits perfectly this morning to know that we are okay. And then maybe, just maybe, to ask other people if they're okay. Now, if Grandpa, I think he would be okay with this, but I've switched, I've altered, I've edited his license plate just a little bit. I am okay, you are too. So now I may apply for that license plate here in Texas. Does it have too many letters and numbers? I don't know if I've hit the limit at seven, but I'm going to apply for it and see. Now, the reason I love this is because for believers, we're affirming what God has done, and then we're also encouraging other believers in the truth. I am okay. You are too. And that's why we can get off that train of self-improvement. That's why we can cease all of that project of trying to get close and get forgiven and get right and stay right and and try to get in God's will and stay in God's will and try to feel something. Can anybody relate to trying to feel something? I mean, that is the enemy's perhaps the most present, most persistent temptation is that if this were true, I would feel it. If this were true, I would, quote, experience it. And we even have to watch out for the word experience because when I say, experience God, what happens to you? When I say, do you experience God? Everybody goes, well, I I mean, uh, one time I had a weird feeling in church. Uh, I mean, but it it could have been indigestion. I I, I mean, what, what do you mean? And so some people will offer us an experience of God. Come down the aisle and feel something for four minutes or nine minutes. Uh, We sing songs and our emotions rise, and that's awesome. We are emotional creatures and we're meant to feel. But the problem is the enemy will hit us with, are you experiencing and are you feeling? And if this were really true, then you would feel something fantastic. And let me tell you, we're going to see today that that is a grand deception. And it's really important to know that because it is an attack on our completeness in Christ. Man, I love emotions, I love feelings, but I also know I can't trust them, right? You can't trust them. They can come out of nowhere. They can come from anywhere. They're not reliable. They're not bearings, good bearings for truth. But we are created to feel. Now, the problem is, is that the enemy will try to enter into the back door of our conscience and tell us, tell us things like, you should, you ought to, you better, what's wrong with you, why aren't you feeling, why aren't you experiencing? So, the bottom line of what we're going to see today is, if you are in Jesus Christ right now, then I am okay, you are too. Amen? That was weak. But we'll run with it, okay? All right, the first one, do nothing to get closer to God. Now, I'm telling you that there are 4,500 Bible study curriculums out there that say that this is dead wrong. And you're going to have to decide what's the truth. But as we dig into God's Word, we find an incredible reality. Do nothing to get closer to God. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 says this, Do you not know that the one who joins himself to a prostitute is one body with her? For he says, the two shall become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Now, I love this. The, The parallel is obvious. The analogy is there. And we don't even have to talk about it. Because the reality is, man, you are as close to the Lord, spiritually bonded, connected, fused, as you could ever be. If you have been joined to the Lord, you are one spirit with Him. You can't get any closer than that. 
Man, I love Bible study. We're looking at God's word right now. But do not let Bible study be a stepping stone to closeness with God because the Bible says you're already close. Get it? Why do we study God's word? Because he's already married us. He's already joined himself to us. He's already made himself one with us. And then we open open the Bible and we experience our spiritual husband speaking to us in his word about what's already true of our closeness. And that experience is a knowing, not a feeling. And so there are many many deceptions out there about getting closer to God. And unfortunately, they prey on our emotions, don't they? They prey on our emotions because we feel unclose. We feel distant. We feel dirty. And then someone says we need to get closer. And so we immediately, well, we buy into that sales pitch. Do you know what I'm talking about? Praying on insecurities. Now, people aren't doing this on purpose. I mean, for the most part, uh, many uh, proclaimers of the gospel, I mean, they went to a, a school perhaps, and they wrote down what their professor said in their notebook. And then three years later, they were hired. And then they stood up in a pulpit, and they said, well, what am I going to say to these people? I know what I'll do. I'll get out my notebook, and I'll read from my notebook this prepared message that my professor taught me. Now, what I'm saying is, is that these ideas are perpetuated down the line of human history and the most common assertion, the most common teaching on closeness to God is not that you're one with Him, not that you're one spirit with Him, but that you need to get closer, that you need to inch closer to the God of the universe and here's two ways to do it or three ways to do it or five ways to do it and the last thing you're going to hear is that you need to do nothing. I mean, it's scary for me to preach that we need to do nothing. But it's the truth because of what God did. Jesus said it is finished. He's already died and resurrected. He's already made us one with Him. What could I do to add to that? Man, I can act on that. I can count that as true. I can... Uh, think that way and choose to respond that way. I can act on it, but I can't make it more true. I can respond to it, but I can't activate it. We've even got words in, in some sound theology today. We've got words like appropriate and activate. Have you ever heard that? Man, you're totally forgiven. You just need to appropriate it. Okay, I'm going to go home and appropriate it. Have you ever tried to appropriate something? Man, that's a really cool word, and it sounds real theological. I'm going to activate it and appropriate it, okay? Let's activate your forgiveness. I'm gonna, for the next five seconds, I'm going to activate my forgiveness. <clears throat> I mean, is it activated yet? Have I done it yet? Is, can you all tell me if it's activated? Do you see the problem with telling people they need to do something? And so sometimes the message is do nothing. In other words, just have confidence where you're at because where you're at is in Jesus. Where you're at is a fully forgiven state. And so he says, anyone who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you that I am one with you today. I don't feel a thing. In fact, sometimes, Lord, I feel the opposite. I feel like you're ticked off at me. I feel like you're disappointed in me. I feel like you might never forgive me. I feel like, I feel like, I feel like, and just pour out your heart to him. But, but I do know the truth, and those feelings are not the truth. Do you know that it's okay to believe something contrary to your feelings? Some people feel like they're a hypocrite. Have you ever heard somebody say, I got to be true to myself? I got to be true to myself. I got to live out what I feel. If I feel it, then it's, I, I can't just, I don't want to shove that down, so I got to live by it. I don't want to be a hypocrite. Well, you know what? It's actually hypocritical when we don't live like the holy, righteous, bonded, fused, perfect children of God that we really are. That's hypocrisy. When we live contrary to who we really are. So here's one, do nothing to get more forgiven. Now this is a big message around here. Admittedly, you hear a lot about our total forgiveness, but 
I'm not sure that we could teach enough on this because this is a big one. These are the things that we've done wrong, right? These are the things in our file drawer. These are the things that haunt us when our head hits the pillow. These are the things that hit our conscience and attack us in any given moment. And we can't change our history, so the enemy is happy to bring it up. The enemy is happy to bring up something from the past and pummel you over the head with it, left, right, and center, and say, look at what you did, and you call yourself a Christian. And so this forgiveness thing, I mean, in that moment when you're accused like that, in that moment when you're attacked like that, and I want you to think of something perhaps or uh, three or five things that you're particularly ashamed of from your past that you've wrestled with, whether it's a habitual thing or a one-time thing or whatever. And in the moment that you're attacked with that sort of evidence from the past, what do you do? What do you do? Do you try to justify? Man, not that many people got... It wasn't that big of a... I mean, it only happened... And we try to justify. What if, what if God is calling us to do nothing? Is that believable that God would want us in that moment to do nothing? What would justify just doing nothing and saying, you know what, that doesn't matter. When I do nothing and I say that accusation doesn't matter, you know what I'm doing? I'm counting myself dead to that thought. I'm doing nothing about it. I don't need to engage. I don't need to get in the courtroom. I don't need to worry about a trial. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I can do nothing. I can, by doing nothing, I'm resting in what Jesus has said is true. Do you see that? Sometimes the hardest thing is to do nothing. The Bible says this about our forgiveness. For by one offering, he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. One of, one of my favorite verses, we quote it all the time here. It's so powerful. In a single sentence, the author of Hebrews has just demolished the idea of getting more, getting more, getting more, getting right, getting clean, staying right, staying clean. No, by one offering 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ has made you perfect for all time. So I can hear the opposite, the devil's advocate the critic of this message of the finished work of Christ, and they're saying, isn't there something we should do? I mean, how about apologies? How about getting right with someone that we've hurt? How about uh, reaching out to trusted friends and asking them for prayer? My goodness, we are on board with that, man. James says, confess your sins to one another so that you can pray for one another. Let's do that. That's healthy community, right? And the Bible tells us that we... If we're lacking wisdom, let's ask God. God, I don't know what to do in this situation. I just ask you for wisdom. Jesus Christ, be my wisdom in this. I am, I am at a loss. You ever felt that way where you don't have an answer? I mean, the comfort of God's word is this. God, I don't know how to pray. I really don't even know what to say right now. And I certainly wouldn't put it in King James English for you. So what do I say here? And the Bible tells us that God prays for us when we don't know how to pray. So there's something here about doing nothing and that that is actually worship. Because I am worshiping what Jesus Christ is to me and what he's done for me, then I can rest and practice the art of doing nothing to get more forgiven. Apology to another person, absolutely. Asking for prayer, absolutely. But as far as, that's horizontal, guys. There's the horizontal and then there's the vertical. And if the vertical is not set already, then how am I going to live the horizontal? Man, have you noticed the horizontal is hard enough? <laughs> Relating to other people, uh, forgiving other people, navigating difficult relationships and, and situations. The horizontal is sometimes horrible, right? The horizontal is super challenging. And then folks come along and tell us the vertical's not okay. So now you're doing this. I can hardly even do that. I'm trying, but it's like scratching your head and, and swirling your tummy at the same... I can't do that. Horizontal and vertical at the same time... No, God has prepared the vertical. 
the vertical is finished. I'm not saying we're grown up, we're still learning, we're grow up. To me, that's almost like horizontal, the renewing of the mind on this planet, figuring out how to work things out that have already been worked in. To me, that's like God in the horizontal. But the vertical, even though we're growing and learning, the vertical is done. We are right and bonded and fused and one and forgiven and righteous and free from condemnation. And the vertical is a non-issue. Yes, we're getting counseled. Yes, the Holy Spirit is invested in our lives. But we don't have to wonder where we are vertically. Do you know what it's like then? I mean, just imagine what it would be like if we remembered this. If we remembered to walk around realizing that we are vertically fused and connected to the God of the universe in every moment and that the horizontal flows from the vertical. But if I think the vertical, well, I'm out of fellowship, the vertical bond has been broken. The vertical bond is temporary. The vertical bond is at 68%. The vertical bond is in process. No, the vertical bond between us and God is perfect because we are one with Jesus Christ, forgiven forever. See, if we weren't forgiven forever, then we'd have the Garden of Eden all over again. Oh, you ate from the tree. Well, get out of the garden. You died. We would die on Monday, and we would die on Tuesday, and we would die on Wednesday. And some people believe this. They literally believe that they lose their salvation every time they sin. So when something happens in the horizontal then the vertical is broken in that moment. And that is not the truth. We get to live the horizontal knowing the vertical is permanent. For by one offering, He has perfected for all time those who were set apart or sanctified. All right, well, the next one is, is kind of a biggie. I, I mentioned Christian curriculum, and I, I, I don't know how many times I've been thumbing through a book or a Bible study booklet or watching a video or something, and it is super popular teaching to say that your heart as a Christian, your heart is hard, your heart got hardened back in 1982, you're still trying to soften it up, uh, your heart is sinful, your heart is in process. Uh, I posted something about the heart of the believer on Facebook. You may want to check it out sometime. The, the comments that followed, I mean, people were just in disbelief. Literally, they did not believe and thought that it was a borderline heresy to teach that the Christian has a new heart and a right heart and an obedient heart and a good heart because we've been told so many times, nobody is good, only God. And, you know, Jesus is walking around talking to Pharisees, talking to law keepers, talking to people under the old covenant. And Romans says, everybody's dead apart from Christ. But I ask you this morning, are you apart from Christ? Everybody's dead apart from Christ, but are you apart from Christ? No. So therefore, you're the opposite of dead, you're alive, you're the opposite of deceitful, you're truthful, you're the opposite of wicked, you're righteous, you're the opposite of unregenerate, you're regenerated, you have a new obedient heart because you're a believer. What in the world are we thinking when we say, I'm born again, but I've got a wicked heart. I'm born again, but I've got a deceitful heart. I'm born again, but my heart is being fixed up. Well, what was born again then if it wasn't your spiritual passions and desires, if it wasn't your spiritual heart, then what was born again? And so we see in Romans chapter 6, uh, verse 17 and 18, it says, Thanks be to God that though you were slaves of sin. Hit the pause button. How many people on the planet were slaves of sin? All of us. Who is this written to? Any human that gets saved... Though you were slaves of sin, you became obedient from the heart to that form of teaching to which you were committed. And having been freed from sin, how many Christians are freed from sin? All of us. You became slaves of righteousness. So we got people who, I mean, they think it's humble to talk about how sinful they are. And I get it, man. I have committed 
uh, two billion sins. That's a rough guess, okay? I've got, I've got the actual figure at home. <laughs> but I have committed so many sins. I have messed up big time. I have given in to temptation. I have had wrong thoughts and wrong actions and wrong ideas. And man, I have done as much stuff and more than you have, okay? That is the stuff I have done. But that is not my spiritual resume. I look at this. And this is my birth certificate, slave of righteousness. This is my birth certificate, obedient from the heart. And I am asking you to join me this morning in agreeing with God's opinion of you because it is not God faking himself out. It is not God pulling the wool over his own eyes. It is not God with Jesus glasses sort of giving himself a false impression of you. No, it is God taking you to the cross at salvation, taking you to the cross, burying your old life, resurrecting you to a new life, just like you were a slave of sin. How real was that? How real was your slavery to sin? Just like you were a slave of sin, now you're a slave of righteousness. Can't get away from it. Can't stop it. Can't, you can't get rid of it. Yeah, but what if I, but what if I, but what if I, no, slave, man, slave. You were bought. You can't get away from it. I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Nobody can snatch you out of my hand and call you their own because you are a people of my possession, a slave of righteousness. That's why it's a total joke that we have to worry about too much grace or too much forgiveness. You don't have to worry about too much grace or too much forgiveness. The slavery part has got you covered. I mean, if you're a slave of righteousness, if you're harnessed and connected and fused with righteousness and you can't get away from it, then apparently you can afford to be forgiven, okay? You can afford to be forgiven and it's not going to be just chaos. You can afford to be forgiven and it's not just going to be uh, all kinds of liberality. You can afford to be forgiven because you got the heart surgery, a transfusion. You got changed and transformed at the core of your being. You became obedient from the heart. So let's, let's take these ideas that are out there and let's make them captive Let's take them captive. Let's make them obedient to Christ. Do you know what I'm talking about? The Bible tells us to take every thought captive and make every thought obedient to Christ. So, my heart is wicked. There's a thought. Now, let's make that obedient to Christ. Christ gave me an obedient heart. Well, my heart's in process. You know, my heart is hard right now. No, no. No, let's make that obedient to Christ because you know what? Your mindset, your attitude right now, you might be digging in your heels about something. The Lord is wanting to counsel you towards something, toward a softness of forgiving somebody, toward a softness in responding to somebody. The Lord is counseling you toward that. And in your attitude, you're saying, no way, not yet. They don't deserve it, Lord. They, I'm not ready. And so that's an attitude, uh, a hardness of attitude but it is not a hardness of heart. Your heart is the thing that is driving you to forgive. Otherwise, God is saying, please don't be yourself, would you? Would you forgive that guy and just don't be yourself, okay? If you could just be me or like me instead of being yourself. And that is a very average view. Gosh, I wish I was more like Jesus. Doesn't that sound spiritual? Let's take that thought, obedient to Christ, I wish I was more like Jesus. You know what the Bible says? As he is, so also are we in this world. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that I have a heart like yours, that you gave me a new heart, that you dwell in my heart by faith. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, that you have made me trustworthy and good and new at the core. Thank you, Lord. I just made that thought obedient to Christ. Do you see it? And so there's no compromise. It's black and white. You're either bad or good. And the Christian world, it seems like we don't want to call ourselves good because we think that's bragging. Do you see that it's bragging on Jesus? That's what it is. It's bragging on Jesus. Thank you, Jesus Christ, that I'm a slave of righteousness. I can't imagine you telling me to act holy when I'm a slave of sin. 
I can't imagine you telling me to put off envy and put off slander and put on love if I'm a slave of sin. That, makes no, that would be a total conflict. Thank you, Lord, for rigging this thing and prepping this thing so that I'm equipped to live in the new way that you say is my destiny. All right, well, we'll finish with this. Do nothing to feel something. Here's what the Bible says about all that. 1 John chapter 5 These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. Do you notice? The Bible never says so that you may feel. The Bible says so that you may know. And I'm telling you, I mean, my mom, back when I was a teenager, my mom taught this uh, women's retreat, and it was called the Knowing Place. And the whole retreat was about distinguishing feeling from knowing. Knowing who you are in Christ, which is something that you don't always feel. And so I love that title. I love that expression, the knowing place. If you are in Christ, that is a place of knowing, not always a place of feeling. So whatever you think I'm feeling, whatever you think that our elders and deacons are feeling, whatever you think uh, people who've been around this message for 20 and 30 years are feeling, uh, let me just say... We're not. We're not. We're human feeling all kinds of stuff. We feel groggy around 6 a.m. We drink coffee and then we feel not so groggy. We are human and we're feeling all kinds of stuff. But what we're excited about around Church Without Religion is not our feeling, but our knowing. Because we know something about what Jesus Christ has accomplished how big that accomplishment is, how close we are to Him in geography, in proximity, not in emotion. We are excited about what Jesus has done. It's a knowing, not a feeling. So, man, you're going to get all kinds of sales pitches. If you would just uh, go over here, and if you would just uh, do this thing over here, then you would feel. And if you would come forward, you would feel. And if you had this spiritual gift, you would feel. And if you just learned this secret knowledge, added on to your Christianity, you would feel. And if you would just, then you would feel. Man, if you would tithe, you would just feel. I mean, if you would just keep the Sabbath, you would feel. And people are saying, you would feel what I feel. And you know what Paul says about that in Colossians 2? Man, there are people that take their stand on experiences, visions, dreams, all kinds of feelings and stuff. And most of it is just lies. Most of it is not true. And even if somebody else is feeling something, uh, you know, they feel great during an awesome song. I mean, I could look over. Have you ever looked over? Have you ever looked over at people who are singing uh, songs about the Lord and you just say, I mean, they got their hands raised and they're kind of dancing. Not too much, so they're semi-Baptist and semi-charismatic. But I mean, they're dancing just the right amount for this building to kind of tempt me to want to move a little. But man, they're experienced. Man, they're feeling. You know what? They could be thinking, gosh, I hope people are watching. Man, I hope somebody's thinking, what is she feeling? Because I want to feel, I'll have what she's having. Right? I mean, that's what people might be thinking you never know what's in somebody's thoughts and so when I experience chase and when I idolize and when I say that I want something that somebody else is quote experiencing I don't got my eyes fixed on Jesus I don't have my eyes fixed on the finished work of Christ and I'm saying I'm not complete and I'm not enough and I want to take that thought captive and say I am complete and I am enough what do we see today Well, there are plenty of things that we can do, right? I mean, we wake up every day and we offer our bodies to Jesus. We wake up every day and walk by the Spirit. We wake up every day and set your mind. We wake up every day and we love other people. But you know what? All of those decisions come because our mind is clear and we're not preoccupied and we're not freaking out and we're not worried about trying to do all these things. Got to get more forgiven. Got to get closer to God. Got to fix my heart. Got to feel something. Got to experience something. And so we see the conclusion then, do nothing. Sometimes the Lord's uh, answer to us, His counsel to us is just stand firm. Do nothing to get more because your confidence is in 
Jesus Christ. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for you being I am right now, that we don't need to hope you'll be something for us tomorrow, that you are I am right now. We thank you that we don't walk by feeling, that we walk in confidence that Jesus is, he's accomplished a historical thing for us, the cross, a historical event, the resurrection, a historical event, a fact, not a feeling. We thank you that it's a fact our sins are taken away. It's a fact you're not dealing with our sins. You want us to look to our Savior. It's a fact we don't need to get closer. We're one spirit with you. Father, we thank you for these facts that guide us and show us the truth about Jesus Christ. Remind us in the times that we're feeling awful, in the times that we're feeling nothing, remind us that it's not a feeling, it's a place of knowing. Knowing that you've done what you've done, and it's perfect. Thank you, Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. I, I hope for you this morning that this uh, gave you a kind of spiritual and a mental GPS recalibration. Um, if you're, I don't know how you are for sure, but sometimes in the morning I wake up and I'm lost to myself. I don't know where I'm going. I don't know what I'm thinking. I start thinking about what I got to do because of what I didn't do and all those kinds of things. And isn't it a good thing to come together around the truth and to have a recalibration, a rethinking, so that we remember where we are? Any man who is in Christ, is he a sinner? No. If he does it, does that make him that way? No. How many things in Christ do you lack? Nothing. What's your condition? Is it good? Is it pure? Is it holy? Of course. This makes the New Testament read well and be sensible to us. That Oh, that's why it says that. That's why we're new creations. That's why we have a new self. That's why we've been forgiven. That's why we've been cleansed from the past. That's why the present is true with God. And that's how he always sees us through what he did. And he wants to help us with our faith. And I hope this morning that Pastor, Pastor Drew's message gave you a, a recalibration, a, a rethinking of how well off you are with God because of God. So that you can then walk in that life, his life given to you. Amen.